Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, for being with us on relatively short notice. Our chairman, Colin Moynihan, and the chair of the British Olympic Association Athletes Commission, Sarah Winkless, are with us this afternoon. Of course, we're here to uh, share with you uh, our reflections and reaction to the decision that was announced earlier today by the Court of Arbitration for Sports. So with that, Colin, if you'd uh, begin, please. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for coming. Uh, the BOA's eligibility bylaw is both proportionate and consistent with EU and, competi and UK competition law, the restraint of trade doctrine and human rights law. It considers the circumstance of each offence. Its aim is to exclude those who willfully cheat uh, from ever representing their country at an Olympic Games. It is tough, but it is fair. Of greatest importance, it has a strong appeal mechanism to ensure all the circumstances are taken into account. It provides a route to protect those who inadvertently or unintentionally make a mistake, those who do not cheat their fellow team members. Fundamentally, the BOA bylaw addresses eligibility, and it is not a sanction. Also, the bylaw provides an avenue for appeal and allows for the consideration of mitigating circumstances. It recognises there's an important difference between intentionally breaking the rules by willfully engaging in cheating through doping or making a simple error. It is, in that sense, proportional. The bylaw has stood the test of time for over 20 years. The reason is clear. The BOA bylaw pursued a legitimate aim which reflects the Olympic Games as the pinnacle of sporting achievement, embraces the Olympic ideals and the fundamental principles of fairness and clean sport. Today, the bylaw continues to enjoy the same level of widespread support from the athletes it did on introduction, and they are the very people potentially affected by the bylaw, some of whom, after a lifetime of dedication and training, tragically never made it to a British Olympic place and the chance to strive for the podium because their teammates decided to cheat them of that opportunity. We've reviewed the um, findings that were published this morning and um, in line with the agreement of the BOA Executive Board, what we have done is to write to the International Olympic Committee and to seek the endorsement of the IOC to protect and support the autonomy of our National Olympic Committee, the British Olympic Association, to select, lead and manage teams to all Olympic accredited games and to have the eligibility rules in place to determine who we select to represent our country. Um, we've done that against the background which is very different to the findings from the Court of Arbitration that you will have read this morning. And the main and fundamental difference is that the World Anti-Doping Agency have written to us and assured us that our bylaw uh, is in line with the 2009 World Anti-Doping Code. That letter will be available to um, you at the conclusion of this press conference. But that is the critical and fundamental difference between our bylaw, our eligibility bylaw, which is absolutely in line with the WADA code and recognized by WADA as being in line with that code, and the findings that emerged this morning in the uh, IOC UCAS case where the IOC's position was deemed unlawful and contrary to WADA because it proposed an additional sanction. And that is really important. The support of WADA for our bylaw and for the eligibility bylaw that we have is critical. And I just conclude by saying that you know, this is a bylaw that was introduced with the support of the athletes for the athletes. And Ever since it was introduced nearly 20 years ago, it has consistently had over 90% support from British athletes who want a clean games, who want to make sure that those who are eligible to support, to, to represent Team GB at the Olympics are clean. And we have in place, I think, one of the world's leading systems um, for making sure that we differentiate between those who have cheated, knowingly cheated their fellow competitors of the opportunity to represent the country and those who've made an error and can appeal and the overwhelming number of appeals have resulted in a success for those appellates in front of um, the appeal mechanism. It, it is a sorry day for the International Olympic Committee. Um, Jacques Rogge has fought ever since he came into sport 
to eradicate doping in sport. And I'm sure he and his colleagues will very much regret the fact that their Rule 45 is not in place for London 2012. But I hope that um, the IOC, working with WADA and working with the NOCs, will, as a matter of urgency, look to ensure that they can put in place tough and effective sanctions in the future that go further than what is currently um, enshrined in the WADA code and comes closer to the position that we have had um, in our eligibility bylaw for over 20 years. Uh, those are my opening remarks, and I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who is, uh, as you've heard, head of our Athletes Commission, because uh, this eligibility bylaw is there for the athletes, and it's important that you hear from the chair of the British Olympic Association's Athletes Commission. Thank you very much, Colin, and thank you all for your time today. I mean, for me, this is massively important that we keep canvassing and checking with the athletes about this law. It did come in in 1992, and every time we have an Olympic team at an Olympic Games, so summer and winter, we do canvass the athletes, and the overwhelming support is significant. It's 90% plus every single time we ask the athletes about this, and, and we will make sure we keep asking the athletes. Um, for me, it's massively important, and I've been very proud in my three Olympic Games to know that I'm standing wearing my uniform against athletes who have worked extremely hard to get their selection, get their places, and ultimately win their medals. And they've done it in a way that they can be proud of and really look at themselves in the mirror at the end of the day. I had a personal experience in 2006, it wasn't an Olympic Games, but it was a World Championships where I crossed the line in second. Due to good drug testing, and the boat that beat me were subsequently um, found to have cheated and banned. I got my um, world gold medal retrospectively, and I can tell you that as I picked my silver medal up off the floor, where I had unfortunately placed it shortly after the race, it was a very sad moment because I would never get that day where I got to receive my gold medal in front of my home crowd, which was a, a home world championships. And I think it's just so, so key that we send the message about how important it is to our athletes that we want a clean team, we want a clean sport. Every athlete is, who's training for London now will have known about this by law. Um, as they started their career, we are very open about it and we're very honest about it. And it is, for me, it's very important that we do have the good appeals um, process. So you can see that if an athlete does make a mistake, if it's minors or there's significant mitigating circumstances, they will be listened to and the athlete will be able to represent their country for Great Britain at the Olympic Games. And that we will continue to do and take the case-by-case -case basis. Sarah, thanks. We're happy now to take questions, Ashley. I don't believe that the British Olympic Association position is isolated at all, and I think one of the interesting recommendations that was embedded into the findings um, this morning in Lausanne was that actually now was the time, if the IOC wished, to take this further and to consider whether or not there should be tougher sanctions such as um, the IOC wanted to see with their Rule 45 embedded into the WADA code. And it was interesting to see that that was actually proposed. So. Over the last 20 years, um, the BOA has taken a tough line on eligibility, very different to a sanction, taken a tough line on eligibility. It is aligned to the athletes, and above all, those are the people we represent in the British Olympic Association. And we take a very fair and reasoned position on a series of doping regulations, which are fully improved, fully approved, include our eligibility by law, by WADA, and have embedded into them an appeal mechanism. You say, well, do you think it's wise to have an appeal mechanism? And I say yes, because there is a major difference between somebody who makes an error, somebody um, like Baxter, who was taking a Vic inhaler in this country, who went to the States, bought a refill of a Vic inhaler. In it was a tiny amount of a different substance, which actually wasn't even on the prohibited list. It was a generic substance that was caught under that list. That action, to me, Ashling, is very different 
to the actions of an athlete who knowingly over a period of time would take a cocktail of drugs consciously and purposefully to deny other people the opportunity to be selected to represent the British team. Now because there's such a major distinction, I think one of the problems with Rule 45, though it was a blanket approach, there was no appeal mechanism. And I think it's essential for good justice that there is an appeal mechanism that can differentiate between a, a, a case such as I've mentioned with Alan Baxter and the case of others who knowingly set about cheating in order to enhance their performance and deny other athletes the chance of selection for their country. And Bob, why, why are coaches any less culpable? Well, uh, as far as coaches are concerned, um, they do fall under the same regulations. And as you know, Linford Christie is in that position. Um, there is absolutely no evidence that has ever been brought forward with regard to Gobbler, who um, I have seen coach for many, many years. And I think it would be wholly inappropriate and wrong to even put him in the same category um, in your question as those who have knowingly um, cheated and been caught and been um, punished as a result of becoming ineligible to um, compete for Team GB. Owen? Um, I guess from the Guardian. Um, what degree of comfort do you think you will receive from the IOC? Presumably you've taken soundings already. Um, and then just the second part of my question, I mean, as that thing says, um, whether the word's isolated or whether the word is, is, is just having a different perspective from the rest of the world, it's clear that, that Britain stands fairly alone in having this, having this position. Would you like to see the rest of the world come closer for our position? Um, the answer to your second question is yes. We've always um, sought that. We've always argued for that. We believe, uh, as I say, our bylaw is proportionate and it is fair and it has a strong appeal mechanism. And ask any of the athletes over the last 20 years who have been party to that 90% vote, and both after the winter and the summer games, and they will say, there's nothing more important than making sure that the Olympic Games is clean. And I'll absolutely add my voice to that. And you know, there will be press releases from other athletes who have come forward today to, to talk of that. We would love to see an Olympic Games that is completely on a level playing field. The, the, the reason for the letter to the IOC was because we know how important it is that the IOC supports the autonomy of the National Olympic Committees. By the autonomy of the National Olympic Committees, enshrined in the IOC code, is the right of National Olympic Committees to select, to manage, and to lead their teams. Different National Olympic Committees take different approaches to this. If you move away from the anti-doping issues, there are some National Olympic Committees in the world who actually have a percentage of those who they select for the Olympic Games who they specifically select because they've got an opportunity to compete at the following Olympic Games and they give them exposure to the next, not necessarily because they're the fastest or, or the best athletes to select from. They have a, a policy that focuses on that as a, as a key criterion for their selection policy. Here, um, what uh, has been at the centre of a lot of your questions over the last couple of weeks has been, well, is your autonomy going to be affected as a result of this ruling in um, uh, Lausanne? Our very firm view is that the answer to that is no. Our autonomy will be fully protected. The autonomy to set the eligibility bylaws necessary to select, lead and manage teams we're writing to the IOC to seek confirmation of that in the light of the findings, and we would hope that we would have a strong endorsement of our position from them. Bob? Colin, I'm sorry. It seems to be inherent in this bylaw, is it? It's in moral judgment. You say it's, it's proportionate, but it's, it's draconian. It's a large ban. And what the athletes who are affected by it, you have no evidence that they're dirty. They, they, they've cheated, cheated in the past, but they are now clean. You know, they're, they're being tested even more and they're, they're available to selection in every other sport. Is it not the case that this, this bylaw, in fact, has no room for redemption, you know, allow no one to make a mistake? As a, a, a young athlete who gets led astray, an athlete who has performance um, uh, clauses in his contract with him, uh, sponsors of the BOA share, and actually this bylaw is not just. Um. You wrote that this morning, and yeah, let, me a let me let me let me it's a position, and let me respond. One shared let, by let, many people in the anti-doping well, who are paid to. Let, let, let me let me respond to the to the position. Yeah. Um, first, I think you need to focus on 
the rights of the athletes who have been denied the opportunity to compete and to be selected for their country because they've been beaten by somebody who's knowingly set about cheating and making sure that that honest, clean athlete does not to get to represent the country. In sport, there is nothing more important than being clean. Second point, what message does it send to a 16-year-old or a young person going into sport that actually, if you just serve two years, which is the vast majority of um, first-time sentences under the WADA code, you would actually never miss an Olympic Games. So knowingly taking a whole series of drugs to performance enhance, to improve your performance, could lead for the vast majority of people currently under the WADA code, the two-year ban for the first sentence, if that happened in the next two years, post-London 2012, not to miss Rio and not to miss the following games. I think it is essential that we send a signal that there is no room whatsoever for those who knowingly cheat to deny somebody who is clean, to deny somebody who is young and keen on sport, the opportunity to have a career in sport. That to me is vitally important. The next point on redemption is actually addressed. I mean, it's a technical issue and it's actually addressed in the context of the findings this morning. And it shows that that hasn't operated effectively in the context of the Rule 45 of the IOC. And I'll draw your attention afterwards to the relevant clause. And, and then finally, um, the existence of an eligibility bylaw in the United Kingdom has not meant that athletes who knowingly took drugs cannot reform. If you, know, if you look at Miller, there is somebody who is unquestionably reformed, but the eligibility bylaw is still in place. He's doing a lot of powerful work now to deny the, the interests that might exist in other athletes to take drugs to enhance their performance. He is a remarkable athlete, but he knew, as all athletes know, that if you take drugs to enhance your performance, then you will be in breach of the eligibility bylaw. He knew that at the time, he knew the consequences at the time, and I'm glad to say that he is a, a, a case of somebody who is absolutely reformed and meets your criterion without the eligibility by law ever being removed. And he's doing a lot of very positive and constructive work in that context. And, and speaking personally, it, it is always tragic to see great athletes athletes who could represent this country, making themselves by their own decisions ineligible for selection. That is um, a deeply regrettable and tragic story in sport for all of us who love sport. One very brief follow-up. Yeah. You mentioned that the IOC, the ruling, directs the IOC to go back to WADA and incorporate it in the code. Not directs, it uh, encourages them encourages to. Encourages them to, and yeah. that's clearly the route that will be taken to try and achieve the same effect yeah. by a legal means. It will still only be one game and it will still leave the BOA. Not necessarily. That's not what it says. It, what, what, the IOC will push the life band on the um, you, you need to ask the IOC. I mean, clearly we, will be, clearly we will be advising them that if there is to be an eligibility bylaw, then within the WADA code it could be amended to uh, be notwithstanding the Olympic Games and in the circumstances of the Olympic Games, um, certain categories of um, banned athletes could never be eligible for participation from any country. And clearly the British Olympic Association would be supportive of that. Thank you. Okay. Mark? Yes, I, to, I think Sarah, when you, said, you, you, when you were denied a, a gold medal in that race, well, I mean, actually, what's going to happen now is that more and more, you know, the rest of the world, everybody can send people who've been banned for gold to, to London, but not just not British. So actually, we're, you know, it's like they're saying the rest of the world can do it, but we can't. For me, I think it's, it's a very, um, it's a good stance that we take with this um, bylaw. Um, I've always been very proud to um, line up side by side with people who I know are clean. And, you know, we can be even more proud of our, our medal table positions that we have achieved because I can't control what the rest of the world do, but I can be um, instrumental in supporting the BOA in, in this and hoping that we can send that message out. Right back here. Surely now, will uh, Miller or James go to Cats and say, look, 
you made this ruling on the IOC, we made the same ruling on VOA. Does CAS in her own statement say the rule, ruling is not in compliance with the IOC's own charter and the World Anti Doping Agency's code? Yeah, but, sorry, that's my point. That was the decision made about the IOC and the Sean Mevitt case. But the starting point for the British Olympic Association's eligibility bylaw is a categoric recognition by WADA that we are compliant with the WADA code to have an eligibility bylaw. I mean, that, 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 the conclusions reached in the Sean Merritt's case was that the IOC had acted unlawfully because they'd proposed an additional sanction. So, the, so um, what was deemed by CAS um, to be a sanction and not an eligibility rule immediately put it into a context which meant that it was an additional sanction because they recognised first that it was a sanction, not eligibility by law, and then it was contrary to the WADA code. And there was no letter, for example, no evidence from WADA in their submission that they strongly endorsed within the WADA code the right of the International Olympic Committee to put Rule 45 in place. Whereas there is a strong written endorsement following the 2009 WADA code that the British Olympic Association's eligibility bylaw is compliant with the WADA code. So you're confident that given that distinction, if changes went to pass, you would win the case? I, I'm very confident that that significantly strengthens our position um, with regard to the eligibility by law. Absolutely. It's, it is a critical distinction to be drawn between the LaShawn merit finding and the position that the um, BOA has. Uh, we are fully compliant with the WADA code, and that is vitally important. This is an eligibility by law. It is not, as in IOC Rule 45, a, a sanction as determined by CAS this morning. Right here, and then Ashley. Fairly said that the whole sanction system is in a complete mess. Um, no. Well, no. I mean, as far as the BOA is concerned, our eligibility by law I've just described. So let's address the first part of your question about sanctions. It is absolutely fair to say that I, exp I anticipate there is serious disappointment in Lausanne today that. Um, Rule 45, which was put in place with good intent by the International Olympic Committee um, in Osaka to tackle the, the um, effect of cheating through performance-enhancing drugs, is no longer in place. And, and that clearly will lead to the IOC reflecting and hopefully sitting down um, with WADA and with the International Federations and the National Olympic Committees to rectify that. They will not want to be in a position whereby that is not rectified because to them um, Rule 45 was of great importance to demonstrate that the Olympic Games were the pinnacle of sporting achievement and that as far as the IOC were concerned those who'd served a minimum six months ban in the last four years should not compete at London. So there was no doubt that they would be very disappointed today that that objective is now lost. But that is totally separate from the eligibility by law of, uh, of the British Olympic Association, which has been there 20 years. And would you like athletes to be banned, not just from the Olympics for life, but from all sport, all their sport? Uh, we are absolutely focused on the eligibility for the Olympic Games. And the board and the Athletes Commission focus on the Olympic Games. I think there are many wider issues, restraint of trade is one, with a professional athlete competing on the circuit um, for world championship when there's a lot of money at stake. There were no prizes um, in terms of money for competing at the Olympic Games. That makes a major legal distinction when it comes to arguing the restraint of trade question. So there isn't a straight yes or no answer to your point. It's uh, an important and detailed legal question. But as far as our responsibility is concerned at the British Olympic Association, we stand strongly behind our eligibility by law, which is there <coughs> with the full support of the athletes to make sure that we have a clean games and a clean team. We'll go Ashling, then Owen, and then we'll do one more. Go ahead, Ashling. There's a follow on from Martin's question. Yeah. So do you, as the rest of the world, athletes who have been banned are allowed to compete at London, do you think that London would be a fair game as far as the British team is concerned, given that you might be on the uh, starting line with them or uh, you know, in, the, in the other boat? Uh, and or do you think the scale has been something that's a result? 
I think the IOC will be disappointed that a number of athletes who anticipated that Rule 45 would prohibit, prohibit them from competing will now be able to compete. If you read um, the uh, Le Chon Merit findings today, there were, I think, four additional names mentioned in those findings who will now compete. Um, in addition to that, there may well be um, many others who have um, served um, the six-month ban in the first two years and um, who would now be competing but were not, part, were not named in any of the evidence. So there's only five, including LeSean Merritt, who are named in the evidence. But I heard last night there were many more around the world who would now um, be eligible for nomination. Clearly they've got to um, still be selected by their host nation, by the, by the National Olympic Committees. Owen? We don't know how many. Uh, I, I wouldn't use the word solid. I mean, I would really hope that the IOC and WADA act now and uh, everybody involved um, take action as soon as possible to make sure that everything is done to ensure these are the clean games in London. And from the athlete's perspective, I'd absolutely support the IOC in, in looking, working with WADA to make the, it as strong as possible, to keep as many people who, you know, just to give the strong message about the sanctions if you, if you choose to treat. Owen, and then Paul, and then we'll be wrapped up. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll so very, so very quick one. I mean, no, no, obvious question, but there's a challenge from, from Chambers or, or Miller, whether that's a cast or a high court, will you, will you fight that challenge? And the uh, second part of the question um, is more about the attitude of the sports as well. I mean, obviously, in this case, athletics, track field, and, and cycling, have you spoken to them about, about how they would feel about selecting either of those athletes? Um. I don't want to personalise this, and so I'll give you the process that we will go through for any athlete who challenges um, uh, a finding under the bylaw. Uh, first, we need to receive the basis for any challenge, and we would look through that very carefully before taking a, a view. Um, secondly, we would need to um, have a board meeting, which we always call in these circumstances, to consider the position that we would take in any individual circumstances. So there is a process. And it's a process that we've gone through before on the process that I hope we'll never have a challenge in the future, but if we did have a challenge for anybody, we'd go through in the future. Non-sports? Um, we haven't spoken in isolation to any one or two or three sports. What we do know is that there's um, strong support from the bylaw from the sports, and above all, there's strong support for the bylaw um, from the sportsmen and women who represent Team GB, and that consistently that support to me has been vitally important. No, I've told you before on a number of occasions that my job as chair and the job of the BOA is there to support the athletes. And when 90% plus of the athletes are saying we want a clean game, so we want the eligibility by law in place, it is incumbent on us as a board and as a National Olympic Committee to work with the athletes to achieve that, that goal. Paul, oh, will be all done. I just wondered if there were any other forms of cheating that you think you'd like to bring in to the Napoli that would be cast out for the rest of their career. I mean, I think through an event to propagate gambling. Yeah, I mean, I think gaming is a very important example, by the way. And, and, but I think gaming, uh, illegal gaming, um, is something that we are looking into at the present time, and that uh, falls into the category of about uh, of such severity as to warrant us to look carefully about what sanctions should be taken in that context. Uh, you know, this is going to be a growing problem. Um, Jacques Rogg highlighted um, gaming as being what he perceived to be one of the greatest threats to London 2012. And we are currently working on seeing what can be done in that context and what advice we should give to the athletes. Um, but you know, as I say, it's, the position of the eligibility by law is tough but fair, but it's by no means um, uh, different to the toughest sanctions that can be taken in the professions by lawyers, for example. Um, by doctors, and indeed the toughest sanctions that can be taken if somebody um, drink drives and gets involved in an appalling accident, uh, he will not be um, back at the wheel of his um, car uh, again. So it's not it, 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 a tough sanction f in sport, which is in a very different world, needs to be applied only in the rarest of circumstances. And the rarest of circumstances is where somebody knowingly deprives somebody who might have spent 15, 20, 25 years training clean to be selected to represent his or her country in the Olympic Games. 
that to me you've got to think about those who the rights of those who have lost their opportunity to compete and for that reason um, amongst many other reasons the eligibility bylaw is in place to protect clean athletes there's no evidence though, that david miller has cost any place in the olympic team um, david, drugs uh, i'm not talking about individual cases at this point no, no, i'm talking no. about i'm talking about the principle that you and i both know that if somebody knowingly takes a, cock a cocktail of drugs and enhances their performance and goes out there and denies somebody the opportunity to be selected for that team, then that is um, unacceptable. There is no place on the British team there's for an eligibility on the British team for that. But the bans that are applied in different um, jurisdictions for, for example, by the international federations, and they differ, um, need to take into account the situation, and they are the judge and jury of the individual infringement. There are many issues, therefore, that need to be taken into account at that point. Ours is not about a sanction. Ours is about an eligibility bylaw. Can you really, and can you really compare No, I'm not talking about people being killed in medical negligence, for example. I'm talking about the principle that a toughest sanction should be applied within sport for those who knowingly cheat and deprive honest, clean athletes from competing for their country. And if you do that, and if you knowingly take that decision, you will be ineligible for selection for the British team. In sport, that is the parallel. Just, 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 just the very last one. Last one, we're going to break. Can you just say... You will do everything. You will now do everything in your power to keep this plan in place. I can say that I will do everything in my power to make sure that the eligibility bylaw remains in place, with the full support of the athletes who, consistently over 20 years, have sought to ensure that we have a clean team competing cleanly at the games. Thanks, everyone.